Okay, so we're all here, but Ashley, we're going to talk today about the calculus that will be used, not just this semester, but for the entire school year. And so there's really not any physics here. It's just math. Some of it will be, re be review. Some of it will be absolutely new. So <clears throat> when you're bored, you know, just bear with me. And when it's new, well, learn something. So I have the calculus things we're going to use in class in chronological order here. So the first thing we're going to use is the definitions of velocity and acceleration. So V here, well, I put V sub X, that means it's the, the speed in the X direction or the component of the velocity in the X direction. Velocity is speed with direction. And so the speed in the X direction is defined as, and so I really should have put it like this. The three lines means it's defined. So it's dx dt, the derivative of my x variable with respect to time. That is what speed is. Speed is the rate at which position changes. So we're going to have potentially problems where we say, well, it's found that an object that is oscillating, you don't have x sub x, has x equals a sine of omega t. And I ask you, what's the speed in the x direction? You need to be able to take that and say, well, the speed is the derivative with respect to time. And so then you take that derivative, and this derivative should be something that's reasonably comfortable. So who can quote to me the methodology for finding the derivative of a sinusoid? Well, let, let's start the game. What do I do with that capital A? It's a constant. It just stays. Constants stay when you do a derivative. And what do I do with sine of omega t? Okay, now I didn't understand anyone, but I know, of course, you answered first. So what did you say? Of course, so. Sorry. Okay, we're going to have minus cosine of what? Omega t. And we're not done. What else do we have? Yes. We have the chain rule. We have the derivative of the argument of cosine. Because derivative of cosine u du, or excuse me, derivative of sine u du is minus cosine of u. But u in this case was omega t. So now using the chain rule, I have to take the derivative of omega t, which is just going to be omega. And so that's the speed. So that's a straightforward derivative. I used here a sinusoidal function. I'm not expecting you to have memorized things like tangent, but I do expect you to have memorized cosine and sine. And now there's one more thing that I did pay attention to, and because I did pay attention to, I did it wrong. What's that? What did I do wrong, everyone? Here? Yeah, with that. There is a mistake. No units? Um, the units are contained within the A and omega, so that's okay. I mean, units are important. I don't want to say no! I don't know if it was a trick question or not. No, no. It's sine has a positive slope. It's cosine that has the negative. And so paying attention to that rule is also important. So there it's done right. Now, if I want to find the acceleration, if we look at the second line, the acceleration is the derivative of the velocity with respect to time. And so in the x direction, the acceleration in the x direction is the derivative of the velocity in the x direction with respect to time. So for the acceleration, I would take the second derivative of that. And so the second derivative of that, leave the A omega just as it is. And now I'm going to put out the minus omega sine of omega t. And so since I ran out of space, I'm not going to rewrite. But you can see that's minus A omega squared sine of omega t. So that's 
using sinusoids, using cosine and sine. Like I said, I don't expect you to have memorized the derivative of tangent. We will use that, but I'll be happy to have you, you know, look at a, a derivative or integral table for things that are not common. We also may have polynomials, you know, things like x raised to the fifth power. How do I find the derivative of x raised to the fifth power? Okay, you bring down the power, yeah, and, then minus one. and then minus one for the remaining power. Yep. So if I'd had, changing color, if I'd had x equals 7t to the fifth with arbitrary units, because our units are important, then dx dt, the 7 remains there. We bring down the 5 raised to the, and I'll put 5 minus 1 to be very explicit. Everybody knows 5 minus 1 is 4. I don't expect this to be a confusion, but to be explicit on how I got that power. So what if it was x equals 7? What would the velocity be then? It'd be 0 because it's the derivative of a constant is 0. And you can actually use this polynomial rule for the derivative of a constant. Because a constant means, you know, if it's just x equals 7, that's exactly the same as x equals 7 t raised to the 0 power. Because t raised to 0 power is 1. And so then when I take the derivative, I bring down the 0. And so I'd have 7 times 0 over t. Well, that 0 made my answer 0. Okay, so we have that. But notice there's another option here. Well, given speed, find x, that's actually. I want that eraser. Now I'm going to go back because I prefer that. One. This one here, given acceleration, find the speed and the position. Now that's a little bit different. I am going to, hmm. I'm not sure how this works. We'll see. <laughs> not the way I thought it would. Um, I added space down here at the bottom, apparently. I'll add some more. So let us say that I have, yes, green, A of T is equal to B. B just being a constant. What does it mean when I have A parenthesis T? It's important because otherwise you'll get confused when we go further. Gila. You just want to look at um, things with terms of t in terms of t. That, that's in the area. What it means is my acceleration is a function of time. And so sometimes when we're being really explicit, we will say f parentheses x, y, z, t, meaning we have an, a function that varies with variable x, variable y, variable z, and variable t. So when I put a parentheses t equals b, that means my variable is t. There's no t in the right-hand side, but it tells me what my variable is. So if I have that, and I want to find the speed, how would I find the speed from that? Okay, somebody knows the answer. We had, by definition, v is equal to dx dt. And A is equal to D, missed the D, V, DT. So if I have A, A has a V hidden inside of it. It says A is D, V, DT. So I can substitute that for acceleration, and I will have D, V, DT is equal to B. Now we have the simplest possible differential equation. How many people have even heard the word differential equation and anything other than somebody saying, you're going to have to take differential equations someday? Only Gila. A differential equation is exactly this. We have a differential, a derivative, is equal to a function. And with this simple differential equation, we can solve it very quickly and easily for V. And this is how we do it. So this is I assume new to everyone except for Gila. 
we need to separate variables and then the next step will be integrate both sides independently okay i'm just erasing the word independently integrate both sides so what does it mean to separate variables to separate variables means i'm going to have my d's in the new random position on opposite sides of the equal sign and all of the variables that are one are on one side all the variables the other on the other so that means i'm going to have to multiply both sides by dt to get dt on the right hand side and then I have to make sure all variables with T in them are on the right-hand side, or all terms with T are on the right, all with V are on the left. So in this case, separating variables is trivial. I just multiply everything by DT. That is multiplying everything by DT. And I have DV is equal to B DT. Now my first equation, DV DT equals B. That's... That's the equation that we would assume is always true. If I multiply across by dt, it should still always be true. Now, at this point, I'm going to take a, a really brief time out. What does the d mean when I'm doing a derivative? Change. D means a change. Well, in the physics 151, I'm going to use the capital delta to mean change. So in physics 151, I'm going to use, that means change in, so whatever after, you know, delta x means change in x. So what's the difference between those two? Between the delta, the capital delta, and the lowercase d? The interval? Okay. Lowercase d minutes, it means that it's an infinitesimal change. Infinitesimal means it's on the order of 1 over infinity. Calculus was invented. There's still argument today, but I will say it was invented by um, Sir Isaac Newton. Because during the what, year and a half or so where school was canceled because of the Black Plague, he was doing all of his great physics work. Basically, all the great physics work that he did in his life was there because there was no school. <laughs> and... He came up with his three laws of motion. He came up with his law of universal gravitation. He wanted to work with problems using these, and he realized there is no math that can help me solve my problems. And so he invented a new math for infinitesimal changes. Um, I can't remember what he called it. He had some obscure name for it. And he wrote in a paper that using this new math he'd come out, he could solve it. Didn't explain what the math was at all. And then, uh, was it Le Leibowitz? Le something or other. A French guy read the paper, came over, said, hey, tell me about this math. And so Newton explained it. And he went back and he wrote up a treatise on this new math, calculus. And since he was the newest, the first one to publish it, Especially the French people say he's the one who invented calculus. But since he was taught it from Newton, I tend to think that Newton's the one who invented it. What we can say for sure, though, is we use the symbols and the explanations from the French guy because they made a lot more sense than the explanation and symbols used by Newton. But the point of this is it was to solve these kinds of problems that calculus was invented, the math of tiny little variations. And so we take this. Because my original equation was a true equation, just multiplying by dt, it should still be, true, still be true. But the left side only depends on velocity. The right side only depends on time. And so these two have to be simultaneously in agreement. So if I integrate, I can integrate the left side just as a function of velocity, the right side just as a function of time. And as long as my time corresponds to when I want to find the velocity, it still has to be true. So now I do that step, I integrate. And whenever you integrate, and this is something that in my experience in calculus classes, they don't pay a lot of attention to. Whenever you integrate in physics, you pretty much are always going to have limits. 
So I'm going to integrate from limits and I'm going to start from V initial equals, well, I don't know. So I'm just going to put V initial to V final. So those are my limits for V. And for time, to make life easy, I'll start with t time initial is equal to zero because I can just set my timer. You know, I started it now. That's when zero was. So to make life easy, we usually set time starts at zero. And then I will end at time final. And I integrate the two sides. Now, I'm not even going to ask anyone to do the integral. I chose the trivial thing. Derivative of dv is v. And I'm being very explicit. And I want you to do your first homework problem equally as explicit. After this first homework problem, you never need to do it like that again. But I want you to show in each problem the steps involved so that it's clear that, yeah, the back page. Um, so we have to oh, um, yes. It, I tried to share my OneNote drive with you. I'm experimenting with that. I will also upload it to Moodle. Oh. And of course, you can watch the video too. Yay. Do you won't see my face? Double yay. Oh, that's good. <laughs> like it Integral of b d t is going to be b t going from time initial equals zero to time final, and so I put those in, and I have v final minus v initial is equal to b t final minus b times zero, and so now I have an equation, my v, and at this point. I put a V final for the upper limit because it's mathematically forbidden to have the variable of integration the same as your limit. You can't have the integral dx from zero to x, right? That's forbidden. So you can have the integral of dx from zero to x final. When I'm all done, I relax that and just drop off the f's. And so I'm going to solve this for V drop off the final on the T as well. And there's my speed function. Now, of course, I ran out of space, but if I'm doing this right, <laughs> there was an if. This button here. Okay. I, I swear I did this earlier in this very same lecture. Maybe I have to use my finger. Yep, have to use my finger. That's the key. Ah, crud. <laughs> I moved down all my writing with it. Still don't have any more space. I just have space right there. <laughs> well, I'm learning. Kind of. Oh, yeah, it's when I get to the next page, it's messing me up. Try this. Okay, forget it. I'll practice on my own time, not your time. So I have that equation for the speed, and I'll just put this on the top of the next page. I wanted to find the position. Now I have an equation for speed. How do I find position? I do what? I need to integrate again, but what do I need to do first before integration? Separation of variables. So my V, we know V is defined as dx dt. So I have dx dt equals bt plus V initial. How do I separate the variables? Go ahead. Multiply both sides by dt again, just like I did before. And so that gives me dx is equal to parenthesis bt plus v initial dt. Now I have to integrate both of these independently. So I put my limits on there. And now if I do the integral, the left side is going to be x final minus x initial. The right side is going to be a little more complicated. So, okay, I'm going to do something I didn't want to do. I'm going to go, come over here to the right. 
make my pages fatter. I'm not sure what that's going to do when we print them out as PDFs. We'll find out, won't we? <laughs> so this gives me X final minus X initial equals And for this time, I'm going to spread it out. I'm going to use the distributive there. I separate it into two integrals since it was a polynomial. What's the integral of BT dt? Okay, it's going to be one half BT squared. My limits are going from zero to T final. And, of course, the integral of vi dt is just vi t. And so this is going to give me, when I expand it out, and so now, once again, dropping the f's so that my, my position is just going to be the position at whatever time t is, I have x is equal to, that was written, my t looked like a square, <laughs> x is equal to x initial plus v initial t plus one half v t squared. And that is one of our basic kinematic equations. We can see from, well, shall I say, very basic differential equations it's easy to come up with this equation. For a, a trig-based class, you can do some hand waving. You can say, okay, so let's take the average if the acceleration is constant, blah, blah, blah. And you can get to that. But here it's pretty straightforward how we get to this, trig, this kinematic equation. Kinematic equation means equation of how things move. This equation is correct as long as the acceleration, the B, is constant. If B changes, well, then we have what we call a jerk. The jerk is the rate at which acceleration is changing. And the equation is going to have another term that's going to have, well, take the integral of one half t squared, and that's going to be one sixth t cubed. So it's going to have a one sixth t cubed term in it. And then there's other things beyond jerk. I had a student last year who actually knew what was it beyond jerk, and I was like, wow, I guess I didn't. <laughs> So that is the first calculus we're going to be doing. That is the calculus that's going to get us through the first exam, right? Just, just that. Now we have some other things we're going to work with. So moving on, we'll have something like this. Work is defined as the integral of force dot dx. The dot product is something I assume everybody knows because you've all taken Algebra. Now you didn't probably take linear algebra. Dot product means you're multiplying the parts in the same direction. And so there's going to be a little complexity, and I'll go through when we get there exactly how that works. Then the next one. What is this thing? I, I circle the minus sign. I don't mean the minus sign. Yeah, if it was facing the other way and didn't have a vector sign, you'd know exactly what it is. What that is, is a directional derivative. It's called the gradient. And I'll show you the gradient in Cartesian coordinates because it's the only one I have memorized. Wrong, wrong symbol. <laughs> I am making more mistakes. There's no time in this. Okay, what does the I hat mean? <laughs> Not the I hat, it's the thing next. After that, the i hat is telling us a direction. The hat means it, it's a unit vector. It has a magnitude of one, and it's in whatever direction 
And so that's in the I direction. Some textbooks use IJK for the three independent coordinates in the Cartesian system. Some of them use X hat, Y hat, and Z hat to indicate those. Some use E with a subscript of X. Some use E with a subscript of I. It depends on your book. And so there's lots of different ways of writing that, but that's simply a unit vector to give you the direction. And then that, that funny D means it's a partial derivative. How many people know partial derivatives? Just one, again. So this is something that we're going to work with. Here's all you really need to know about partial derivative. It's the easy derivative. A partial derivative means we're going to treat anything that's not that variable as constant. So I can have something that's a function of x, y, z, and t, but if I'm taking the partial with respect to x, that means I'm going to pretend y, z, and t are all constant. So it makes my derivative much easier because all these things, I don't have to use the, um, the chain rule on the y's, z's, and t's. I can just simply say, they're constants. And so you're taking the partial with respect to x, how the function changes if x changes, in the, and then with the x direction, plus how it changes in the y direction, plus how it changes in the z direction. So that's what that means. And this is really cool. Go ahead. It's always one of them? Like, yeah, whatever is in the denominator one is the one that you're not treating as a constant. Oh, okay. So can it sometimes can it be like two, two x, y, and you'll be, you treat x and y as not constant, but the other ones are constant, or it's always just one variable that's... Um, you can have something that's almost like what you said. You can have d second dx dy, but that's two derivatives. One treating x is constant, one treating y is constant. Looking at what I have here in the partial helps you to understand why we put second derivatives, right? A normal second derivative is something like d second dx squared. Why do we square the d on top but square, square the x on bottom? Have you ever wondered that? Because I know when I was taking calculus, I was totally, why? Why isn't it d squared on top and d squared on bottom? Hmm? That would be one. <laughs> the, <laughs> well, sure. <laughs> Not exactly, but I can see what you're saying. <laughs> the, the reason we do that is on the bottom, we're telling you what's changing. And so if it is dx dx, that means it's the first time you do a derivative, it's going to be changing x. The second time you do a derivative, it's changing an x. And since they're both the same, we just say dx squared. That's telling us x is changing both times. On the top, it's how many derivatives we're doing. And so we just put the, the exponent with the d because that's how many derivatives we're doing. So the top is how many we're doing. The bottom is what's changing with each one. And the order doesn't matter. dx, dy should be the same as dy, dx. Okay, so this equation is actually really cool. Notice the top one gave us work if we know force and the motion. The bottom one allows us to find force if we know U in this case stands for the potential energy. If you know the potential energy function, for instance, the simplified form of gravitation is the force of gravity is MGY. And when you use the top equation, you find the work done to raise something and potential energy is just minus that. And so potential energy is um, should be one half mgy squared. And so you take that lower equation, you say, well, what's the force? I take the derivative, the directional derivative of one half mgy squared. Derivative with respect to x of mgy squared is zero. And likewise for z, it's zero. So it's only going to be the y direction that's non-zero, and then I have the partial with respect of y of one half mgy squared. Bring down the two, you have mgy. The minus sign is there because the force is down. And so knowing what the potential energy function is, you can find the force. Potential energy depends on the force, so that's the method. It's very useful. The next one, power is derivative of energy with respect to time. 
all the same type of stuff we did at the beginning with, you know, V, D, X, D, T. Force is D, P, D, T. I should have put that symbol there. Sum of forces is D, P, D, T. Does anybody know what this is? Super duper important. Well, it has a name. It's a, a fundamental law in physics. That is the true Newton's second law. Newton's second law is that the net force acting on an object is equal to the derivative of momentum with respect to time. We always see it as some of the forces is MA. That's not perfectly true. This is perfectly true. Okay, now the next piece, finding the center of mass is one over mass times integral of X dm. And you're like, X dm, what's dm? Well, what does that d mean again? It means an infinitesimal change. And so if I have the integral of X dm, the dm is going to be little tiny pieces of mass. So if I have a, a physical object, let's take poles, better to follow. And once again, I'm really bad at enforcing. You're not supposed to have any food or drink in the class. So. Sorry. <laughs> well, I, I feel really dumb about it because until we get to using chemical second semester, there's going to be nothing in here that's dangerous. And it's there for safety reasons. But we have a, a building wide policy because it's only physics and engineering classes where you don't have safety issues every day. Anyway, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to harsh it. You say, no, no, no. Until the second semester when we start using chemicals. Anyhow, but we take Cole's beverage bottle. And so the DM is going to be a little piece of mass. Well, there's a lot of tiny little infinitesimal pieces of mass in there. So my limits are going to have to cover the shape of the distribution of mass. And then my DM is going to have to represent a little physical shape in there. So my DM, if I do a one-dimensional integral, like if I just had a, a wire, I can just say my, my DM is a tiny little, the mass is a tiny little segment of the wire. And so in that case, my DM would be the mass per length. We, for one dimension, we give it the symbol lambda times dx. So I've taken an infinitesimal piece of mass is the mass per length times the infinitesimal piece of length. If it's a two-dimensional distribution, like say it's, a piece of paper, then I can have a function sigma that's how much mass per square centimeter of paper. And so I take that sigma, multiply it by both the dx and the dy to get my d area. And so that's why I have a dA there for d area. And with Cartesian coordinates, that would just be dx dy. You could use some other coordinates to have something different. You guys comfortable using different coordinates? Probably not, right? Not in calculus all that much. You have used them, at least should have. Three-dimensional rho dv. Rho is the mass per unit volume, and my dv, that's going to be something in Cartesian coordinates, dx, dy, dz. Or if you go to spherical coordinates, why would you use spherical coordinates? If you have something that's spherically symmetric, like, say, the Earth, with, with the exception of the crust, the Earth is very spherically symmetric then you use the spherical coordinates and you don't have to worry about your two angles, only the radius will matter because of the symmetry. But your dv becomes r squared sine theta dr d theta d phi. <laughs> the dv gets a little more complicated. So we will be working with those and yes, we will be using spherical coordinates and cylindrical coordinates when we're doing things like finding the moment of inertia, which is this lower one, integral of r squared dm. Then we'll move into sound waves. There's not much we're going to do with calculus there other than what we've already done. But we do have this equation right here and the upper equation that I didn't circle. The upper equation is applying Newton's second law to something like a mass hanging from a spring. You the standard classroom example. You put a mass, you hang it from a spring, and then you put the whole system in water. 
you put in water, there's going to be a reasonably large drag force when that mass moves against the water. And so that gives us something, a force that depends on the speed, dx dt is the speed, so that's where the b dx dt comes from. You have the spring, which gives you a force proportional to how much the spring is stretched. So that's where the kx comes from. And so you have the sum of the forces is mass times acceleration. And so that equation came from putting all the forces on one side, moving two of them across and leaving the external applied forces, F sub t. It's equal to mass times acceleration. For acceleration, we put d second x dt squared. And this gives us a second order linear differential equation. And you know what? I do not expect you to solve a second order linear differential equation because you haven't taken the class for that. Instead, what I will tell you is, well, the solution to this is x is equal to e to the bt. Well, I shouldn't use b because b was one of my variables. Let's use g. <laughs> probably going to be bad because of probably, anyway, just a constant. And so you take that and say, well, if that's x, then dx dt is going to be g e to the gt. And second derivative of x is going to be g squared e to the gt. You put that in, and then you solve for what g has to be. So I will tell you the solution has this form, and then have you solve from there. We're not going to do that today. That's going to be coming up. The lower equation is what we call the wave equation. If you have a wave, if you have a medium that will support a wave, then you have to have the second derivative of your motion with respect to x is equal to 1 over speed squared and the second of your motion with respect to time. And so we will take functions and say, is this function a solution to that equation? So in that case, you just take the second derivative with respect to x, second derivative with respect to time, put them in, and see how it plays out. So those are differential equations. Both of these are differential equations. And we will simply be putting solutions into them rather than saying, what's the solution? I don't know. If you got questions along the way, you know, ask them. Um, I did skip over one equation that was shown here. DF is equal to pressure DA. That's, once again, nothing special, nothing super new. When we get into thermodynamics, we have some new, new nomenclature that really doesn't matter. In fact, your textbook probably doesn't show this nomenclature. Here is something that is very often missed in physics. Work and heat are transfers of energy. You don't have a device that contains X amount of work. You have a device that can do X amount of work because it contains X amount of energy that it can use. And the same is true for heat. Nothing contains heat. I talk, you guys may or may not know, uh, Dr. Abby used to be a biology teacher. And apparently biology textures are really bad on this. They will say something contains this amount of heat. That's absolutely not possible because heat, because heat is defined as transfer of energy. So Q and W, by their very natures, are changes. But we never write change with it. We just put Q and we put just put W because this definition is a change. But then when we start trying to do calculus, we get to some interesting situations. Because I have something like, um, I want the change, in, you know, the, the heat flow per time. And do I put a DQ DT? No, because the Q already is the heat flow, right? And so that's what the slash is there for because it's, it's not a proper D because the Q was already really a D. And so it's just, it's a nomenclature thing. Usually a textbook will say, that's just not gonna be important to the student. Let me just write this as D E internal, the change in internal energy is equal to DQ plus DW, you know, the, the heat added minus the work or plus the work done on it. This sign varies with textbook because they'll either define W is the work done by the system, in which case if W is positive, energy went out, or W is the work done on the system, in which case if W is positive, energy went up. It changes the sign clearly. It's, 
it's rather annoying that we have both signs that you see. You just have to know which way it goes. Question? Yeah, it's a random question. But do you have a tutor for this one? Um, I don't have a calculus only based tutor, but what I do have is me. Uh, you know, you can come by my office anytime I'm in there. I'll answer questions. <laughs> and we, we will introduce these things slowly as we go through class. I'm just today giving you all the stuff that we'll be seeing just so you can, I know, it's, it's, you can be scared, but so you have some idea what you're looking forward to. Because you're looking forward to it, right? Just let you say yes. Yeah, okay, good, good answer, good answer. Hey, look, here's all that space I put in. Um, electricity and magnetism, beginning of second semester, that's where you really can't do physics without calculus. So in the physics 152 class, we're just going to be giving them some equations and doing some very limited problems. But in physics 252 class, we've got the math tools. And so we'll be able to use equations like, you know, the, the flux is integral. That circle means over a closed, in this case, because it's dA over a closed surface. So it's the integral of electric field dotted to the closed surface. Well, we can do that. Although, you know what? Almost always we're going to use symmetry to make so we don't actually have to do the calculus. But that's a new thing, taking an integral over a surface with a dot product and um, voltage difference. The, uh, the Biot-Savart law is oh so pleasant. Um, this is the Biot-Savart law. I think I pronounce it right. Since I don't speak French, it's that. You have the integral of a cross product. Cross product means you're multiplying the perpendicular parts of the vectors. A little more complicated than the dot product. And so these things are simply stuff that can't be done with, for people without calculus. And so that's something, once again, to look forward to because you can do it. And then when we get to quantum physics, we have this here is the ever famous Schrodinger equation. It's an energy balance equation. It actually says that the total energy, the right side, is equal to the kinetic energy, the left side, plus the potential energy, the middle term. It's an energy balance equation. But, but that's certainly an interesting, once again, second order differential equation. And we will learn to solve this for one or two cases. And that will be the end of our math. So I'm sure you have lots of questions. That's just like an introduction stuff. I have a homework assignment for you to practice your math. And this is all integrals and derivatives, none of the other more esoteric things. I want you to show your solutions explicitly, right? I don't want to see you right here. That's correct, but I want to see that you know how you got there. So for this one here, instead of writing that, do the last one, not that one. Do the last one, not that one. Okay, I'll do the last one. Okay. It's not hard. So the last one, we have f of t is equal to 10 natural log of 4t squared, right? So I want to do df dt equals. There are easy ways and hard ways of doing it. What should we do? The hard way. The hard way. Okay. So doing it the hard way, I'm going to do a u substitution. I don't care if you're joking. I was wanting to do it the hard way. Okay, so DFTT is 10 natural log of U. So I take the derivative. The 10, of course, is unchanged. Derivative of natural log of U is 1 over U, and then I have to use chain rule 
And so that's going to be times the derivative of u, which is 8t. Did I do that right? And I got to put substitute back in. So that's equal to 20 over t. Good enough? Now, what would the easy way have been? I don't know you. I use the rules of logs to simplify my function. And so if I take the derivative, what's the derivative of 10 natural log of 4? But that's a constant, right? What's the derivative? Zero. And what's the derivative of 20 natural log of t? <laughs> well, that's true, but you should be. <laughs> okay, so that's that's working out both ways. Now, one thing I didn't show here that I actually like to see is that this is Right, the two times, because I brought down the two, and then four, t raised to the two minus one. So, yeah, I'd want to see that step as well. I didn't write it, because you know what? Just like you, I know how to do this, so I just zip through it and forget. I want to see the explicit steps. Now, if you look at these, the top ones, the derivatives, they're not that difficult, right? This one here, you know, it's taking the derivative. Well, the top one is a polynomial. The next one is a polynomial with x with negative exponents. It's easiest if you do this just by changing it to 6t to the minus 2. And then you just use the rule. So you bring down a minus 2 and then it goes to minus 2 minus 1 minus 3 power. This one here is just using an exponent to make sure you know how to use the chain rule with your exponent. This one here, what are you going to want to do to simplify that baby? You could, but I wouldn't. Yeah. I would e to the 5t raised to the fourth power. What do you do when you have an exponent raised to a power? You multiply them. So that's e to the 20t. That's a funky way of writing e to the 20t. I would immediately change it to e to the 20t. And then you're going to have to use the product rule. And so I want to see the progression. I want to see that you know how to use the product rule there. And then the last one, well, we did it. Now, for the integrals, they are more difficult on the integrals. I'm not going to tell you which one's which. I do want to see explicit work. So I want to see something like for the first one. Okay, what was the first one? 5t squared minus 20t plus 17. I want to see the integral of f of t dt going from zero to t final okay it's important that you have the parenthesis and then the dt if you don't have the dt you don't know what you're taking the integral with respect to if you don't have the parenthesis you have nonsense because it would be, if you don't have the principle, it'd be integral of 5t squared with no variable to integrate over, and then just two terms that are not involved. So I do want to see it exactly like that. And then you go through and do it. So that's going to be 5t to the 2 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 minus 20t to the 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 plus 17 t to the 0 plus 1 over 0 plus 1 
with my limits going from zero to T final. Right, that's very explicit. Everybody knows one plus one is two, right? But I just wanna see that you're very clear on how you got those numbers. And then of course, And then putting in the limits, that's going to be 5 thirds t cubed minus 5 thirds 0 cubed minus 20 t squared. Oh, that should have been final. <laughs> 20 over 2, you can feel free to write that as 10, <laughs> plus 10 times 0 squared plus 17 t final minus 17 times 0. And then the answer is, of course, drop off all the zero terms. Somebody answer me. Why is there no plus C? Yeah, if you have the limits, if it's a definite interval, you don't have the plus C. It's when you don't have the limits that you have the plus C. So I mean, that's something that people get confused on because so often in calculus classes, we just do it without limits. And then you have to remember the plus C or you're wrong. So that's the kind of explicit thing I'm looking for. Now, there are two things that can trip you up. The two things are number one, apply limits. One of these is undefined, and another one, when you apply the limit of zero, it's not zero. So be careful when you apply those limits. Don't just say, there it is, I'm moving on. The second thing is one of them uses, his name is spelled two different ways, L'Hopital's rule. And the sad thing is, when you use L'Hopital's rule, you come out with what you would have guessed it was without using it. And so students would be like, I just spent all that time to show what I already thought it was. But the, the fact is, it didn't have to come out that way. It's just I chose. I was actually going to spend some time and find a problem where it wouldn't come out that way, but I didn't. So how many people get, blah, 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 feel comfortable using L'Hopital's rule? One? Like two. Okay. If you have a problem with L'Hopital's rule, come talk to me so we can go over it. And I will definitely help you with any one of these problems, right? I'm not like, go off, do it on your own. I will help you. I just want to make sure that you have this down. I have probably only had to use L'Hopital's rule maybe five times in the 21 years I've been teaching this class, right? It's, it's very rare that it comes up. But I want it there just so you remember, I might have to use this in some situation. Okay, so this homework, next class period, I will have students raise their hand and say, I want to explain this one. And we'll have you go through and explain how to do the problem so you can learn from your classmates and make sure everybody gets 100% on this. But try to have them all done so you don't come in and like, oh, <laughs> I can only do the one he did in class. Right. Question out. When's it due? Um, when's it, due? It, it should be due on um, actually two Tuesdays from now. So we'll go over it next Tuesday, and then you have a whole week to, to finish it up. Is that what you're going to ask, too? No, I was no. going to ask. We're, um, I'm assuming, encouraged to do this on a separate sheet of paper. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and to upload it on Moodle. Right. Yeah. Oh. All right. I'm, as a PDF? Yeah, as a PDF. Yeah. Okay.